All right. Hello, everybody. This is James Stanley with Daily Effects. Just want to thank you very much for your time in advance. Here we are, 2021. We got through 2020. And now uh, we got a whole new year to work with. Um, but with that being said, we have kind of a loaded situation here. Uh, and not just in FX markets. I think this is a statement that could be spanned across a number of markets right now. I think, and this is something that we talked about in our final webinar 2020, but I think one of the more uh, glaring items out there right now is the just the general consensus for what most folks, what most desks appear to be expecting for 2021, which is largely a continuation of what we saw in the back eight months of 2020. Um, a massive central bank accommodation, pledges thereof, or prospect of more, to continue driving asset prices. That brings on the, the idea of the quote-unquote everything rally, which is where uh, there's a wide expectation for stocks to continue gaining, for commodities to continue going up, all driven by uh, lower bond yields and a weaker U.S. dollar. Now, if we look at the USD, the past eight months have certainly been dramatic. It was back in March that we topped out at that 103 handle, albeit temporarily. We touched that 103 level for a brief moment in time, after which USD went into a free fall. Now, it was last summer when that move really heated up, but then we saw another uh, run begin after the U.S. presidential election. Notice right here on November 4, what initially was bullish, I mean, soon turned around, finished that day bearish, and sellers have remained in control ever since. This trend has been so clear that I think the major refusication with playing continuation prospects here is just how oversold it has become. If you look right now, RSI isn't technically an oversold territory, but it's diverged. Notice that low on RSI, December 17th. Well, we've made a lower low on price since then. Go down to the four hour chart, you can see where it's diverged even more. There's that December 17 swing low, which we're trading below right now. But notice we have these higher reads on RSI. So RSI is continuing to diverge as USD toils down here at these deep, deep levels. I think the probably the most emblematic item of what's going on here is testing below that 90 psych level. Right? We got two year lows in USD. Sellers have been large and in charge. Uh, well, certainly since early November, but you know, we could even span that statement back here to March. But notice the build of this formation. This is a falling wedge formation. Okay. Now, a falling wedge is denoted by a more aggressive pitch or angle on resistance as to what we're seeing on support. Notice the angle of this trend line, not as aggressively sloped as the angle at resistance, right? This is highlighting how sellers are really active in USD at or around resistance tests when prices are high, when it's quote unquote easy to sell. But when it's tough to sell, when prices are at lows, when prices are testing support, those bears don't have the same level of aggression, the same level of motivation, hence the weaker slope on that trend line. Now, such formations will often be approached with the aim of a bullish reversal. In this case, I'm not looking for a full on reversal. I'm looking for a pullback. Because uh, as I had said in the tweet, talking about this webinar, I was going to cover uh, a few items from our end of the year materials, uh, key of which was the US dollar Q1 technical forecast that I had worked on. Q1, kind of difficult to nail down given everything that's going on, but I do think that we're going to see USD eventually test that 88 to 25 level in the first half of this year. I don't know if it's going to happen in Q1. I did put that down in the Q1 forecast because the sellers do remain in control, then and that quickly happened. But I think we're first going to need a pullback to wash out the sentiment which could keep the eyes on lower high resistance potential around like a 90, 49, maybe a 91, before we may get that next test, that next short side test around 88.25. 88.25 is a huge level to me for a couple of different reasons. First and foremost, and from a reality standpoint, I believe this is the current six year low. Yeah, it's the six year low in USD. But what makes this really interesting is how it came in. Right. This is also the 50% marker of the Fibonacci retracement, spanning the 2011 low up to the 2017 high. Right there at 88.26 to be exact. 
But that's what I'm looking for as a uh, target on USD at some point in H1, possibly in Q1. I think that we might be in for a retracement or a pullback type of scenario before that might come into play. But I'm going to go over a few different setups a little later on in today's session. If you have any specific questions on specific markets, don't hesitate to let me know. I'll be really happy to, well, to try to provide some clarity there. Um, but I'm remaining bearish on USD and Q1. Uh, the biggest problem that we have right now is just how oversold that it is. Uh, a combination of a bullish reversal formation, diverging RSI, both of those point to the possibility of a, a quick pullback. And for that pullback, I'm looking for resistance potential around 90, 49, possibly 91. I mean, if this thing gets really loud, and I think this might need to be coupled with some risk aversion. I mean, so in that case, we might be seeing stocks fall and, uh, you know, seeing the major media outlets doing their markets in turmoil specials, one of those types of deals, that could bring on 92. 92 is a pretty legit level on USD. It's just so far away that if we get back up there, I, I think there's going to be a lot of questions as to downtrend continuation potential, but uh, 92 is confluent. There's two different Fibonacci levels in very tight proximity around that level. It was also a swing low from back in August, and we haven't really tested it yet for resistance. So I would keep that as like an R3, 9049 being the R1, 91 the R2, and uh, right around that 92 handle as the R3 here on USD. All right, but as I had also promised, I would share my top FX idea for 2021. And I think I had even teased this a little bit at the tail end of 2020, but uh, this was the second year out of, I believe, the last four or five that I chose dollar yen as my trade idea of the year, which is really bizarre for me because dollar yen is not a pair that I'm extremely active in. It's not a pair that I follow as widely as, say, like pound yen, pound dollar, et cetera. But when I do these these trades of the year, I try to find fundamental divergences between the represented economies. You know, so if we're in kind of a comfortable backdrop, cross pairs like a pound Kiwi or pound Aussie, something like that could be pretty attractive to me. Uh, it didn't really feel like we were in that environment. Um, I wanted to go, I wanted to look at a short side USD scenario for that trade of the year or for that top idea of the year. Uh, the problem that I had was just that USD weakness was pulled back like the proverbial rubber band. Um, yin, however, I think this one could be pretty exciting because something happened last year that, in my opinion, was kind of behind the headlines. And that was the resignation of Shinzo Abe. You know, if you go back in FX market, say like a decade ago, right, like 2010, dollar yen was a pitiful pair to be trading. I mean, it was tough. It looks like there was a trend there. And sure, there was at times, but there was also a lot of gyration. There was a lot of range. There was a lot of just messy price action, a lot of false signals. There wasn't a lot of, of uh, trend exuberance around the pair back then. What shifted things with Shinzo Abe uh, coming into play uh, 2011, 2012, uh, it was actually a second trip as PM of Japan. But he came into the uh, equation with uh, Abenomics. Abenomics was his plan to turn around decades of deflation and lack of inflation in Japan. And he had three different uh, items. He called it three different, uh, I believe it was pillars or legs of a stool, something like that. One of those was currency weakness. The other was uh, fixing the tax system. And I believe the other was employment law. It doesn't matter because two and three didn't really work. The one that worked, as you can see right here, was the yen weakness theme. So basically, dollar yen jumped by more than 50% in less than three years. Right here we are, October of 2012, we're below 80. And here we are in June of 2015, we're above 125. Now, if you come from other markets and move like that, it's like, okay, well, something new happened. Right, you got the start of a new fresh bull trend. I mean, this is FX though. We're talking about two of the biggest national economies in the world. So a move of that nature, reverberations were felt everywhere. Unfortunately, Mr. Abi's plan of that currency weakness helping to drive higher levels of inflation, 
didn't really pan out. The BOJs continued to spin their wheels in the five years since, and they now own a major chunk of the Japanese government bond market because of that QE. But you'll notice that something's shifted over the past few years. We're not getting that those flares of yen weakness in the same manner that we were. My two cents is that the Bank of Japan doesn't have the same firepower or the same bazooka that they did. And so that if we are going to see a situation of a relentlessly weak U.S. dollar brought upon by continued accommodation from the Fed, which I have a hard time imagining otherwise, but if, if as long as we have the Fed continuing to prop the backdrop with loose money policy, that's something that could see more of this dollar yen move continue to unwind. Um, so my first target, I believe we've already touched through. The big target for me is right here at that 100 spot. And it, for those of you that remember the 360 course from way back in the day, uh, you remember the, the drama that took place there off of that 100 level, that parity level in dollar yen in the summer of 2016. We have these series of lower highs and that support zone is just setting there like a beacon. If we do end up with a flare of risk aversion, then I think this thing could drop dramatically in a really, really quick and aggressive fashion as we see even more unwind of that dollar yen carry trade that was so aggressively priced in the markets now seven and eight years ago. The architect of Abinomics is no longer there. I have no reason to imagine that the remnants of the program will remain for much longer. My two cents, at least. Um, all right, top lesson of 2020. I'll keep this one fairly quick and then we can get into some setups. As usual, uh, the questions from you ladies and gentlemen um, uh, will be addressed during Q&A. I got a few setups that I wanted to look at today, but top idea 2021 is right here. Pandemic versus the central banks. So after you've been at this for a while, there's 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 not a lot that can surprise you. Uh, I think last year surprised everyone, but I think the thing that was the, the most surprising to me was just how quickly and aggressively the Fed acted in March. In March, it seemed like there was an announcement every single weekend. If you go back to the S&P 500 and you look at the way that this thing traded in March, it was almost like opening for the week was just an excuse for it to gap down and hit limit down again. Yeah, we'll go with that one. Nasty week, and we gap down, limit down, and go right back down. I mean, we were off more than 30% in a little under a month. But the Fed remained so busy, so busy, that they arrested that fear. And Jerome Powell even had a comment a few months after that low was set. I believe the comment was back here in May when he said there was really, quote unquote, no limit to what the Fed can do with the liquidity prog programs that are available to them. So my top lesson from last year is really just that we're probably a lot closer to modern monetary theory, to MMT, than, well, than at least than I had expected. But with a fiat currency system, central banks can invariably inflate, inflate, inflate for as long as they want. I'm not going to harbor any um, machinations of being an Austrian economist or anything along those lines. I wouldn't consider myself a neo-Keynesian type of person either. But with that said, I think the big takeaway from last year is the fact that central banks are not only married to this thing, but they don't really have much choice. They have to continue to try to support the economy uh, through the continued coronavirus pandemic. And while I would love to say that hope is around the corner, I try to keep my expectations in check. One thing that trading has taught me is that expectations are the most controllable and, and, and probably the, the, well, the biggest control point that I have on myself. So my expectations aren't that high for things all of a sudden just turning around. But the takeaway from this is the long side of gold, the long side of silver, or perhaps even cryptocurrencies remain as attractive. And this was published December 24th. I believe I wrote it about 10 days prior. 
since then, Bitcoin has went absolutely bonkers. And this was something that I talked about quite a bit last year. If you remember when Paul Tudor Jones started talking up Bitcoin, Stanley Drunkenmiller started talking up Bitcoin. Each time those, those, those happened, I, I pointed this out. But for years, we struggled with that 20K figure. Right, here we are now trading well above 30. Quite the move, quite the move. Uh, so that's what I wanted to look at for my end of the year and then preview for 2021. Uh, well, stuff, but <laughs> any questions you have, don't hesitate to let me know. Uh, now I'm going to get to more of a traditional webinar setup where I'm going to go over um, or I'm gonna go over some setups and formations. Now, if you do want to access any of that content, it is all absolutely available to you. Uh, everything that I drew from here was just directly off of my author page, which you can navigate to by going to About Us Authors. And then you look for the good looking guy, the guy right there. Qualically challenged, yes, but handsome nonetheless my kid. But you go in there and you'll be able to access all of those reports and more. Uh, but on top of that, if you want to access those reports, there are a litany of ways to do so uh, throughout the website. But this is also something that's relatively new. If you are looking to get a little bit better with text or with technical analysis, this is an article that might be able to help right in there. It's another uh, program coming out of Daily Effects Education that uh, we're pretty excited about. Okay, USD. Like I said, uh, my forecast for Q1 is bearish. I'm looking for 88.25 to come into play eventually. But for now, my problem is just saying just feels very, very squeezed. Um, we haven't seen a ton of selling pressure sub 90 yet. I mean, we are just holding right around that two-year low that we've been toying with now for a few trading days. Uh, the economic calendar is also rife with risk. Like tomorrow we have FOMC meeting minutes. I think that could have listed a pullback. I mean, just because of the response that we had after that FOMC rate decision last month. You know, so if we read through the minutes, we find out maybe there's a couple of more cautious voting members this year. You know, maybe that maybe that gives us the the realm of a pullback or a short-term pullback. Uh, the bigger one really is Friday, NFP and Canadian jobs. I think this is something that could kick off some risk aversion or could kick off some risk accumulation or some additional risk accumulation. But that Friday is the big driver. And if we're looking for themes in USD, that's where I'd really be focusing on. Um, so it oversold US dollar. Uh, the problem that I have right now is there's not a lot of major currency pairs that do look attractive for USD strength. There's not much, in my opinion. Uh, one of the few areas or venues I wrote about this morning, it is available right here. Rift pound text, pound dollar to your highs, pound yen, wedge break. But it's fairly clear, in my opinion. All right, go over to cable. Cable had a pretty, pretty boisterous start to the year. Jumped up to a fresh two-year high. Actually, let's start off that weekly. I know I got a lot of stuff going on here. We'll get to that in a moment. Fresh two-year high here in cable. So that 135 level was big. I was not expecting that to get taken out by the end of the year. Notice this gave a really clean inflection back December 19, August of 2020. Came back up, started to tangle with it again late November, early December. But we just barely budged above. And then last week of 2020, we surged up to a fresh two-year high. Now, that two-year high comes in right at a key Fibonacci level. That's a 76.4% retracement of the 2018 to 2020 major move. 36.78 is the spot. Okay, that daily is just gnarly. I got too much going on there. So let's go down to a four hour. All right, now once we get down to the four hour, uh, now we get some stuff to work with. So there's a rising wedge formation in here. It's the exact opposite of the falling wedge we looked at in USD just a moment ago, right? But the logic remains the same. We're basically seeing aggressive motivation from buyers at or around support that's not showing up around resistance. If buyers were as excited at, on this thing at resistance as they were support, we should be looking at something closer to a trend channel. But that's not the case. That's not happening at all, is it? Those highs aren't stretching up there. They're capped right here. That gives us the rising wedge formation. Rising wedges, again, kind of like that falling wedge we looked at, often approach the aim of reversals. Combine that with the fact we have a resistance level that helped to produce that reversal. And that's something to keep the door for some continued selling in cable. Now, getting down a little bit tighter. 
So that sell-off in cable pushed prices down to this 135.39 swing. Random, but this was a swing high from back in early December. And it's a swing low from yesterday. But as I wrote in the report, and this was before the inflection actually showed up, look for resistance to show in this zone right around there. And I'm basically just spanning a prior swing high up to a recent swing low to get that little resistance zone. But I know an hourly, and well, that zone, it, it, it caught the high on that last hourly bar. So we're still in like the first inning, but now the test is whether or not that 36.41 level holds. If it doesn't, that's okay. As I wrote in the report, there's secondary resistance potential up at 36.78, right there, that same FIBO level, right? And the way that I can handle that is if we don't get the hold right here in this resistance zone, then I could look for resistance to play out right here with respect of that prior swing high. If that 37.03 high is taken out, we have fresh eyes. I got no business plan or reversal in the setup any longer. That's one of the few things I have on my radar that could be accommodative for USD strength if it does begin to pipe in in the next day or two. Well, next few hours, next few days, more accurately. Outside of that, it's it's kind of a stretch. Um, so dollar yen, as I mentioned, it's my top idea for 2021. Um, let me uh, scroll back. There we go. All right, so we're sitting at that fresh low right now. This is going to be a real challenging spot to try to establish any uh, any fresh exposure. I think the way to to approach this one right now is very cautiously around those fresh lows and look for some pullback potential. That 133.10 level is pretty big. It's a longer term FIBO. Go here to the weekly. It's the 38.2 of this major move. 1998 top when dollar yen was all the way up at 147.5. 2011 low. 38.2 is right there. 103.10. But you'll notice it did offer, you know, quite a bit of support on the way down. It hasn't yet really been tested for resistance or lower high resistance or short side continuation. You know, that's something that I could keep on my radar. Um, you know, but again, it's just another short side USD play. Nothing to write home about because there's a lot of short side USD plays. If I want to zone this up, I could call that from like 103 flat up to around 103.10, 103.11 to be more exact. But that could give me a resistance zone to follow for lower high resistance, looking for short side continuation. Euro dollar. Um, I hate the fundamentals on this one, but honestly, it, it is set up for bullish breakout potential. And I think that's about the best that I would have on this at the moment. Now, I wouldn't quite call this an ascending triangle formation. It's a little too dirty for that, but I can make the case that there's something similar brewing here. We have horizontal resistance around 2312. Maybe there's a FIBO there or something. I don't know. I got, I got nothing on my charts, but you know, there's been a couple of you know strong doses of resistance off that 2312-ish zone. Um, but I think the big takeaway here is how each of those hits, each of those resistance inflections appear to be carrying a diminishing marginal impact, right? So it's kind of got similar tonalities to an ascending triangle formation. Again, I wouldn't call it that. That New Year's price action was a little too messy, but horizontal resistance is holding, each inflection carrying a diminishing marginal impact until eventually, if buyers remain aggressive enough, this thing could pop. Topside pop, looking bullish breakouts as to how far this thing might run. I don't really have a lot of near buy resistance. I think that 125 level looms pretty ominously, but I mean, it was so messy back here when it was reversing in 2018 that. You know, I would really be remiss if I tried to pull any of those swing highs, um, you know, to call those a hard set and fast resistance level. Unless I had some type of supporting evidence that the particular level might, might carry a little more bearing. But 125 flat would be the, the next big obvious level. Uh, should bullish breakouts take hold of your dollar? Also, that would be a way of balancing off some of that... Um, Reversal risk in cable. I mean, if I'm looking for short side pound dollar, I'm basically looking for reversal in two themes, reversal in USD and reversal in sterling. You know, sure, it might pan out. You know, I showed you a bunch of reasons as to why it might pan out. But if I want to balance off some of that USD risk and instead just isolate a little closer to, to you know, a GBP reversal, you know, maybe something like a, a bullish breakout setup in, uh, in Euro dollar could help out with, with that.
All right, moving along. Aussie dollar, long and strong. This thing has just been power and power and power and higher. Um, almost like it defies gravity. But there is a big zone coming up in the not too distant future. I say a big zone. I'm on a weekly chart right now. So I mean, we're looking at some long-term long -term stuff here. But it's the 88.6 FIBO of the 2018 to 2020 major move. It also syncs up with the 50 FIBO of a really long-term major move. The 2001 low up to the 2011 high. The 50% marker of that major move rests at 179.29. So, I mean, we're talking like 90 pips. Pretty wide for a zone, right? But I can keep it on these longer term charts while following shorter term price action to see if any behavioral changes do take place around those levels. At this point, that 75 spot already appears pretty well worn. Check back for really attractive support hold. It didn't just surge up. Maybe there's something at 77.50. There is, that is a psychological level. You know, but there might be something for short term pullbacks there. Right, as in we got this fresh breakout right now, like I said, long and strong. But if looking to get long, maybe playing pullback down towards that 77.50 level. Notice where we have some uniformity between these two swing highs around 77.42. Color that up, call it a zone. 77.40. 10 pips, that's not too wide for a zone. So there could be some backdrop for bullish continuation there in Aussie. You know, basically just playing a pullback from the from the fresh, the recent breakout. Ooh, Gary Diebel, good point here. Uh, 77.32, September 2016 high. Yeah, I mean, that could be the reason we were getting that, uh, getting those inflections back there. Yeah, uh, to Gary's point, look at the way that 77.50 level helped to set resistance uh, throughout 2016 and, and even through the, the first quarter of 2017. Big, big level, historically speaking, in Aussie. So, you know, I'd be really surprised if we just fly right through this one and, and, and don't even check back for support. <laughs> Gary says, it's Michael Boutros, not me. <laughs> Man, good on you for not taking the credit, though. Uh, much respect. I talk I talk charts with Mike all the time, and and uh, he loves his year opens. He also loves his year highs. He keeps them uh, cataloged pretty well. But at 77.50 level, I mean, this has some historical pull here, right? I mean, it it helped to mark the highs for well over a year, maybe even you know a year and a quarter. First time we're encountering that. Almost three years, 2.75 years more or less. So what this means is a little longer term, but let's say on this weekly chart, if we do see sellers coming in, buyers backing off, if we do end up with an extended wick above that 77.50 level, there might be some reversal potential there, but that'd be like a next week type of thing. So it could be some reversal backdrop just given the historical imports that 77.50 level for now. Given that we got a fresh bullish breakout, about the best that I would have is, is looking for a support hold for continuation. Um, but to take that longer term look, extrapolate that down into a shorter term variety, you know, basically what I can look for is that support zone given way. And then on like an hourly chart, looking for a, a, a new entrance of bearish price action. So, I mean, I would need like a lower low and a lower high to show me the sellers are actually starting to swing a little bit harder. But, you know, again, that'd be like a next week type of thing. For now, this breakout's really strong and not the best I'd have is just following it. But longer term, there could be some, uh, there could be some give off that level. All right, dollar CAD. All right, the patient is terminal doctor. Not quite, but we get that Canadian jobs data on Friday morning as well. So Friday morning, NFP, CAD jobs, should be for a pretty fun outlay. Um, but 
one of the things really striking here in, in Dollar Cat is just again going along with that USD theme, how pervasively weak it has been. Right now, the difference here is that notice that we don't have that same RSI divergence quality off like the weekly chart. It might be showing on the daily already. Yeah, it's starting to show on the daily, but it hasn't started to show up on the weekly yet. But if you remember one of our last webinars of last year, I highlighted this prior support zone. And this had some 2020 open dynamics in it as well. Like if you remember from 2019, it was like all year we were waiting for prices to tick below that 130 spot, dollar CAD. It does it on the final trading day of 2019. And it holds below 130 for like the first week of 2020 with the low established 2952 and the top of the zone around the 130 handle. Now at that point, a reversal began to show. And then as we saw that USD strength on the back of COVID getting priced in, this thing just flew. A really potent combination of both dollar strength driven by risk aversion, CAD weakness driven by plummeting oil prices. We came 21 pips from taking out the 17-year high. Weekly chart. Look at that, just like an ominous beacon sitting on the horizon. We couldn't touch it, couldn't take it out. Price is reversed off that 786 Fibo. And it hasn't really been the same since. But last year, we saw similar drama around that 130, 129.50 support zone, right? Notice we first started to tag 130 back here late, uh, early September. Drove a little bit deeper in the zone after the election in November. We were finally able to get below that zone in early December. But then as we were trickling, trickling, trickling lower, we had that ominous zone of prior support that hadn't yet been tested for resistance. Well, bingo, bango. That caught that December 21 swing high. Almost too clean. It looks like prices want to run down towards this 26, 22 level. And, and, and yes, there's about 50 pips thereabouts from current price there. Now, I know when a lot of retail traders see this, they'll try to take it as a, as a, as a high probability trade. I would caution against that because this Fibonacci level has been there for the past few weeks and sellers haven't been able to bring it into the equation yet. And maybe this is the day, maybe they can get it there. But I think there's a higher probability that we might be see it, seeing a, a short-term trap brewing in, already oversold, in an already oversold market. Case in point, look at the way that sellers are dilly-dallying around that swing low, 26.62. Right, they they set a new low, and they stopped, they stalled, and you'll notice the more that you start picking out these wedges or triangles, or uh, the better you get at identifying patterns or price action, the more you'll be able to catch some of these traps that might be brewing. And so remember, we looked at the falling wedge in USD just a moment ago. That's the same thing right here, dollar cat. If sellers had heart here, if sellers were confident, then we should be seeing that same type of stretch around lows or at support as we're seeing around resistance, but we're not. Instead, we got this, this weaker sloped trend line highlighting how bears really don't have as much confidence behind the move around lows as they do around highs. Now, maybe it is that support. That is also a reason why that support may eventually uh, amount to a reversal or a pullback. So I love the short side of dollar cat. I just don't think that it's there yet. With that said, I don't feel confident enough in it to start lining up longs, but what I could do is, you know, very similar to what I was doing on USD is pick out some of these areas of prior support to try to get my game plan ready ahead of time, like 128, 127.91, for instance, right? There's some good, good prior resistance around that level. Maybe that's a level I could look at for like a, R2, right? Notice we have these three synced up swing highs that match very well with yesterday's swing high. Uh, that's about 120 pips off current price. I mean, that's that's pretty far away. So if I want something a little bit tighter, you know, maybe there's something going on in here. I could call that like an R1 level, right? 2720, about 50 pips off current market price. Not as bad. 
Our three is going to be a lot messier. Just don't have a lot of good sync on those prior highs, but 29 and a quarter seems like it's it's got something going on. That swing low plus is that swing low plus these swing highs. 29, 22 to be more exact, but yeah, it does feel as though there are some traps brewing in here. You know, especially given just how how built in a lot of those trends got in the back eight months of 2020 trade. Um, okay, that's what I have on the FX front. If there are any other pairs that you folks want to take a look at, feel free to type those my way. I'll do my absolute best to uh, address them. Um, but this is a, a thematic type of thing for me, gold. been talking about it for a long time. This is my top trade of the year last year on gold. But my target was was lower than 2K. I did not think we were going to take out 2K last year. But uh, here, I'll probably find it. There we go. That was it. That was my top trade idea for, for last year, long gold. <laughs> Find resistance, 1350 to 1380 area. Six-year high, 1557. We blew through those numbers in like the first half of last year. Um, so at risk of repeating myself, I did not want to choose that for my top idea of 2020, 2021. Uh, I did, however, retrofit it into my top lesson of 2020, which is basically remain bullish gold, silver, crypto. Now, most of those reasons are all fundamental based. I do not think that at any point we're going to see the Fed back down unless they absolutely have to. What would create, what would cause the Fed to absolutely back down? Inflation. If we get surprising inflation prints this year, they may have no choice but to back down. But, you know, even in those Evans comments that we heard a little earlier, I think it was yesterday, he was saying where, you know, maybe average inflation needs to be targeted like 2.5%. And they have a lot of latitude with how they're going to monitor monetary policy. And I think gold benefits in most of those scenarios. So what we've had in gold, and this is something we talked about a lot last year, is we've had a pretty cyclical trend by and large. Right? And I think I even have one of these charts still dressed up. No, I don't. I messed it up. Already, already took that chart down. But here, we'll do it here. I can even show you some of these cycles in gold. Let's go back to a weekly, right? It was around Q4 2018. We really started talking about this stuff a lot. There was that comment from Jerome Powell in October of 2018 when he thought the neutral rate was a long way off, and then markets and like immediately started to spill over equity markets. That is, gold started to pop a little bit back then. We were, you know, in the 1200 range at the time. But at issue there was the Fed's hiking cycle. The Fed hiked four times in 2018. Markets are freaked out. They're going to try to do another four in 2019. So at that December uh, FOMC rate decision, Powell, the Fed said two in 2019. And markets, again, didn't like that at all. Gold benefited quite a bit, though. Notice that this bullish run began in gold. Q4 2018 continued through the early portion of 2019, at which point we then pulled back. But then in the summer, bulls got right back at it again. Another impulse move right in there. Okay, great. And so this was driven by the Fed pivoting, the Fed starting to cut. And then we got to that backdrop where, well, they're just going to wait and see. Maybe the next move would be a hike. We don't know. But as evidence was coming in that that next move would not be a hike, we started to see that strength in gold play out. And then coronavirus came to the equation. Early March, we initially saw the risk bid in gold. But then as there was that rampant demand for USD, everything got pushed down, including gold. And this thing sold off by like 15, is 14.97%. From this high to that low, 14.97%. That's in like two weeks. Two weeks. But then with those fast money policies, all those Fed announcements, the no limit remark from Chair Powell, bulls got back on the bid and then some. Popped us back up to a fresh high. And then the summer was when this rally really took hold. June, July, fresh to your highs right there in gold. Now, go down to a daily chart and you'll 
hopefully we'll remember this August the 7th. I remember that week I was doing a webinar and I'd even talked about the short side or talked about a reversal scenario in gold. And I had a lot of people asking questions like, why would you look at the other side of that? Well, I think as a trader, it's always your job to investigate the, the, the other side of the matter. A good analyst is going to be able to see both sides of an argument. A good trader knows which one of those to work with or how to coalesce the two, perhaps. But on August 7th, gold set a bearish engulfing formation. And I wrote in that week's forecast, look out for a pullback. I thought it was going to be like a minor pullback, like maybe to 2000, maybe to 1920, 1941. No, nah, man, this thing splashed. Went all the way down to that 1859 to 1872 support zone. Big support zone right in here. It was off like 200 bucks in a couple of days. So that's when the bull trend went on pause. And then for the next four months, gold prices just continued to digest digest, digest, all the way until support came in off the 764 Fibo of the June to August major move. Since then, this thing's been pretty structurally clean. Strong bullish trend taken back over in December. We were holding, I, I even kept this in somewhat of a bearish light coming into 2021 because we did have hold at a huge zone. But just like I showed you with those ascending triangle formations, each of those resistance inflections is carrying less and less weight until eventually bull said no more, horizontal resistance, goodbye. And the thing flew. Now, as of yesterday, it was holding on to resistance at this Fibonacci level. It's the 14.4 Fibo of a long-term major move, real long-term major move. The 2018 low up to the 2020 high, the recent gold cycle, more or less. Now, it looks like today, buyers are trying to grasp onto this level to substantiate a deeper run, uh, but I don't like it. Look at all that resistance building off 1950. I think this thing needs a deeper pullback first before it's ready and prime for fresh eyes. Now, as to where that pullback might play out too, I'd written an article on that topic yesterday that you are more than welcome to check out. Again, it's on my author's page. It's right here. Got a couple of different areas to follow for such. All right, and uh, last but not least, I had this on my blotter, but I see Mr. Brian Head had, uh, had pointed this one out. Uh, oil, let's take a look at oil. It just tagged 50 for the first time in, in a long time. Uh, yeah, so oil's still a little messy because of that uh, negative tick back in April of last year. Case in point, oil is messy. My oil chart is all over the place. So what I've been doing on oil lately, right, because I really don't know how to account for this in long-term techs. It's kind of an aberrational event. But what I've been doing is I've been using CL2. CL2 is the crude oil futures continuous next contract in front. It's been a little bit cleaner. Also allowed me to get rid of that negative tick back in uh, April. That seemed more of like a contract dynamic to me, which is why I'm I'm okay with dismissing it. But um, oil's had some bullish structure. I mean, it's had some some attractive bullish structure as well, especially with this test at 50. I don't know that I'd want to be chasing this breakout. Uh, I think at this thing, at this point, this thing's maybe more of a fade than a break. But what I'd want to see before investigating the fade is 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 uh, soften prices softening back below the 50 handle. To give me that exposed wick, highlighting that 50 was the point of resistance that pulled sellers back in. Now, the only reason I'd be okay with reversals there is because I could probably get in at a relatively tight risk outlay where I could look for a one-two just on a pullback, at which point I could then reassess. And if I did want to play reversal, cool. But, you know, this is another one of those where the fundamentals kind of be sw swimming upstream right now, you know, especially with all these, you know, OPEC dynamics. Uh, all these these OPEC member nations that are, I mean, they really need cash. How else are they going to offset, you know, some of the the, the COVID-based slowdown or the COVID-driven slowdowns? Um, you know, so I, I don't see 
I don't see anything that suggests the trend is over yet. But with that said, I, I would probably still be biasing a little bit closer to reversals for now until this thing smashed through that 50 handle. Because again, you know, it's had some some healthy bullish construction. Just took a little while to get its act back in order. All right, that's what I have for today, folks. Want to see what kind of quest you ladies and gentlemen have? Let me know what's on your mind. Mr. William O'Keefe, good day, James. William O'Keefe here. Good to see you on the uh good to see you on, Mr. O'Keefe. Hope all is well. He says a uh, nice move on the buy Kiwi yen. Been long on the euro dollar also. There you go. Well done, man. Good job. It's uh see, I didn't look at Kiwi yen today, but you know, that's and the Kiwi is maybe one of the few currencies that might have some higher rates at some point in the not too distant future. You know, I would be careful around that 75 level. We haven't been there in a bit. But other than that, well done, man. Both good hits. Brian says, Brian Head says, uh, Happy New Year, James. I appreciate that, sir. Thank you. And Happy New Year to you and everyone in the room as well. Uh, Mr. Neil Holiday. Hi, James. You'll be sending out the recording. Yes, sir, I will. Um, unless there's a technical issue that precludes me from doing so, I just want to have that qualifier there. But uh, yes, sir, I will. Uh, I should have this posted up on Daily Effects at about 4 p.m. Eastern time, and I'll have it uh, tweeted out as well around the same time. Right, it's one of those days where I get to filter through a lot of spam comments. So uh, if it takes me a little, a little longer to read your uh, question, please don't, please don't be alarmed that I'm ignoring you or anything. So I'm not. Uh, Mr. David Minano, hopefully I got that right. Uh, thoughts on short and dollar yen? It's just usually a slow mover. I really do like it from a longer term perspective, though. Um, you know, my my qualm with dollar yen is. I think the right way of saying it without sounding dismissive. My problem with dollar yen is it doesn't really appear or feel, I guess. That's what I'm on the basis of a feeling. But when I'm working with it, it doesn't feel like I get the same trend side drive in dollar yen when I'm working with a USD theme. If that makes any sense at all. When I'm working with USD and say like euro dollar or pound dollar, I could feel some really good give in those pairs because those two economies are just so different. But both the USD and the Japanese yen, both being quote unquote risk aversion or or risk off currencies that could be bid in in times of stress, uh, this one will have a tendency to be a little slower move, a little little slower moving during those times. Again, just in my anecdotal experience on the matter. Um, so where I do like it is longer term, because I do think that there is uh, uh, some interesting stuff that's going on. With something like that, I got to treat it completely different than like a short-term scalp or a swing trade or, or anything like that, because it's not. It's a totally different type of trade. Um, but I, I do like the uh, I do like the short-sided dollar yen uh, so much. I mean, I called it my top idea of, of 2021. But these these are these are very different types of deals because they're so long-term. And a lot of the other setups that I'm looking at today, I mean, I'm you know few hours, few days, maybe a week or two. Oh, there he is. Good to see you in the room, my man, Mr. Pete Melos. Uh, James, unfortunately, I have to once again step away and catch the recording. Wanted to send my new year wish for you and yours and all the best of health and laughter. Uh, moving things with my schedule so I can once again participate in your webinars. Really missed the live production. Take care, brother, and hope you in the room soon, my good friend. Thanks. Ah, oh, Pete, it means the world, man. Um, yeah, I can't wait to have you back in the room. It's just not the same without you. So... Uh, if you get the chance, we'd love to see you back in. Um, see, so my next one's going to be the 19th of January. But uh, we'd love to see you back in the room, my friend. Uh, Neil Holiday. And this came in at 118. I'm not sure what it's a reference to, but the uh, only person to have a fight with a lawnmower. Unfortunately, I grew up in Texas, so I wouldn't be the, I wouldn't be the only person. I've seen others that have. doesn't usually work, work out well for the person. But, you know. Lawn care can be a real challenge sometimes. Uh, Mr. William O'Keefe, have a long 77.34 limit, 78.90 on the Aussie dollar. Beautiful, man. I mean, that breakout is really, really just kind of taking on a life of its own there. Uh, 
man, overbought weekly, probably overbought diverged, diverged overbought daily. Diverge is four hour. So yeah, just you know, be careful up here. Be careful up here. Well, good job on that hit, man. Really well done. Mm, good question here. Alessandro Antonio Filippi. Um, thanks for the good insights. Are there any technical levels for Brent that you're seeing at the moment? You know, I haven't I haven't spent a lot of time on Brent ever since we had the negative tick situation. This chart at the least is a little bit cleaner. But it's a good time to draw one up. See what we have here. Yeah, it's not good. All right, what I'm going to try to do is uh, set this up similar to how I have some of my WTI charts set up, especially some of these longer term levels. All right, I would look at that as like the dominant major move. 1998 low at 9.55, 28 high. Uh, that one tests out fairly well. Not as good of recent, but fairly well. Got that morning star right there. All right, and I'm going to work back to front. Yeah, there's something there. I might have one more fib I could work with in there. Let me give it a test. Oh, I'll try it from that swing high all the way down. All right, let's see what we have. So yeah, testing above a big level here. I mean, there's, there's not a ton of emotion, you know, considering how we've been kind of hobbling around this level for about a month now. It's 5136, that's the 50 Fibo of the 2018 to 2020 major move. All right, so I don't see any immediate resistances getting in the way. Um, and basically what we have here is a fresh breakout. So with something like this, I'll usually just go, go to the template of how to approach a fresh breakout. Just let's play pullback support at or around prior resistance. Gives me a couple of short-term levels to work with here. That would be probably the more aggressive level around 53. Um, right back here, there's something around 52 and a third. And then, you know, maybe the last stop for higher low support, you know, calling this a, like an S3 level, be somewhere around this 5136 Fibo, you know, whereas if it didn't hold that 5136 Fibo on a pullback, then it's going to look a lot more attractive for reversals off of this daily. Like, just imagine if this was all wick, if this thing just disintegrates by the end of the day, uh, here, by the end of the week, right? If we do see this thing reverse off, close below that 5136 spot, it's going to look real good for a, for a, for a reversal setup. But until then, it's a fresh breakout. The only thing I could really do is look to follow that higher until it begins to reverse. All right, we're almost at time, so I'm going to have to take the last couple of the day. Let me go through here. Again, I'm, I have to filter through a ton of spam messages today, which is not ordinary, but I guess it's a good sign. 
Um, do you think gold uh, from Mr. Derek Gordon? Uh, do you think gold might pull back before continue? I'll just be straight up about it. The shorter term we get, the more uh, the more variable it is. That's why timing is the biggest challenge when it comes to trading. But uh, I do think we're I, here, here's a better way of maybe uh, of me maybe saying it. Um, let me pull up the gold chart to put it in more of a, like an equidistant type of manner. Okay, we're at 1951.20 right now. So technically we're closer to 2K than we are 1900. I think there's a higher probability that we hit 1900 before we hit 2000. 1900 is far away, but it was a big area of prior resistance. I do think it would get a support test at some point and there's still some unfilled gap in here. Right around that 1900 handle. Um, so I think that may be the best way of, of answering your question uh, as accurately as I can. Um, I think more likely, however, is a support test around that 1920 level. But if I had to pick 1900 or 2000, I'd pick 1900. Okay, to give you guys a, <laughs> to give you guys a, a insight in some of the spam I've seen here, it's uh, one message is toast, another bagels and cream cheese, another orange juice, apple juice, grape juice. Man, you got to watch all that 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 sugar. A lot of sucrose in there. Sucrose, I guess is what it's called. It's no bueno. All right, so I'm going to take the last question of the day. Filter through some more spam, more spam, more spam. Uh, Marcin Shizeki, uh, could you please have a look at Dollar Swiss and Cat Swiss? Thanks. Um, Cat Swiss, I don't really have much lined up on. Dollar Swiss, I got you. Happy to help. This is a good one to end today's session on, too, because. <laughs> Wow. Just kissed off that Fibonacci level and just hold them. Um, so, yeah, this was one that I felt I had a pretty good feel for last year. Um, the S&B started to get a little bit more loud, but their biggest issue is the Euro Swiss, Euro Swiss spot quote. So I don't know that the pressure in front here is going to create the same type of motivation for response out of the bank there. But, you know, with that being said, this has been a super clean trend. And it's been pretty obvious as to why. You know, the Swiss franc, not quite a safe haven of uh, the same uh, at the same level of the Japanese yen or the U.S. dollar, but it does still have some of the safe haven quality, especially with Europe. Um, but with a, a weakening USD and even just a stable Swiss franc, this thing has been able to sink, 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 sink. Come on, the fact that we have had a weakening USD and it's like grease lightning. Uh, but we're currently at, yeah, that's a, a post S&B low. Feels like a pretty dangerous area. But with that said, the, the bear structure still remains. I'd be very cautious of trying to sell so near that support when it's already started to take on kind of an allure of an oversold market. But that 88.50 level, that could be pretty solid. It was good support early December. Uh, that was really just year open stuff. So I don't know that I'd call those resistance inflections. Uh, that was there December 31st, there December 30th. You know, So maybe something around 88.50 to look to for a swing high. Uh, maybe something around 89. Um, that 8771, that is the 236 Fibo of this major move, a really long-term one. The uh, September, or excuse me, the 2003 top down to the 2011 low. Uh, and that, my friends, is what I have for today. Really appreciate everybody's time. Uh, like I said, I'll be back in two weeks. That is January 19 at 1 p.m. Eastern time, and I hope you have the time to visit with me again. But until then, my friends, happy trading.